They came in the meeting room. It was uh, about the quarter of the size of this room. They sat down, and I was the only, if you like, uh, colored face in that, uh, in that room. And I'm going back in the, in the mid-80s, mid actually. One of the big guys, it's bigger than even uh, our Fakir here. One of the big guys, he looked at me and he picked on me. He says, where are you from? And I knew what he was getting at. I said, I'm from Leeds. Yeah. And he paused for a few seconds and he said, no, no, where are you really from? And I said, I'm really from Leeds. He paused again and the third time he asked, where are you really, really from? I said, I am really, really from Leeds. At that point, my management started laughing. They were slightly embarrassed and needless to say, they didn't win the business. But there is a story, the story, the point of the story is, is, is attached to EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion. My talk is not going to be as exciting as John Calder's. Yeah, it's a little bit boring because I'm going to show you some shocking stats. And you all know tomorrow is Halloween night, so I brought the Halloween night a little bit forward tonight, okay, as far as my presentation is concerned. EDI, a lot of people, a lot of organizations use EDI as a tool, as a marketing tool to, to tell the world that they are an equal opportunity or EDI compliant organizations. That may be true in words, but in deeds, it's actually not true. Many organizations don't even know what EDI stands for, let alone implement EDI within their own structures. So, uh, John Holden raised a very good point. Can you please be silent? So, yeah, thank you. <coughs> right, EDI. So, just a little bit uh, definition of what EDI is. EDI, the equality. The Equality Act, which came in 2010, which is amalgamation of previous acts, which started in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Yeah, the Equality Act which came in 2010, and that Equality Act has is legislated, is mandated by legislation. There are nine characteristics of the Equality Act. So I'm going to be a little bit interactive, right, and ask you, audience, what are some of the characteristics of Equality Act of 2010? So let's start with somebody. Anybody? Anybody? Race. Race. Very good. Gender. Gender. Excellent. Next. Any, anything else? Sorry? Age. Possibly. I'm not sure. I can't remember. You're probably right. Anybody else? Sexual, Sexual orientation. Yes. So you got the gist. There are nine of them. There's, uh, there are others as well, like uh, uh, disability and a few others, I can't remember on top of my head, but there are nine of them. They are mandated by the legislation and anybody who's deemed to be violating any of those acts can be prosecuted. Diversity is different. In fact, diversity really means to be different. Everyone in this room and everyone in the world is different. It's not about color, it's about just being different. That's all it's about, yeah? Inclusion. <coughs> For me, inclusion is the most important. What is inclusion? Inclusion is all about you being invited to a group, to an organization, but what happens then? Are you then left alone or are you welcome? Are you proactively, are you proactively supported by that organization, that group, those individuals? That's what inclusion is all about. If you put EDI all together, you can see many, many organizations in this country do not actually have understanding of what EDI is, let alone implement EDI. And cricket definitely suffers right, from the lack of EDI in its structures. And I'll come on to uh, more about, you know, give you a bit more information about EDI. But one thing I do say, I want to say is, EDI is not about positive discrimination. That's very important. Positive dis discrimination is actually it's illegal in this country. Yeah? EDI is about removing disadvantages that are in front of you, the barriers which stops you progressing because of the color of your skin, your gender, your disability, and etc. etc. That's what EDI is about. 
It's not about favors. It's about removing the obstacles so you can display your own talent or you can contribute to society at large. That's what EDI is about. Okay? Right, a, 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 just a small quiz. Who? Now, this doesn't stand for World Health Organization, which might be your uppermost mind. Who is this chap? Anybody? I think Chris knows. You have, you do know. Yeah, but he's keeping stum, right? Anybody? He's actually connected with my presentation today, and you will see, I'll expand on a bit more, and he will be featured in there. I'll tell you his name. His name is uh, um, uh, Bamban Holder, and it's no relation to John Holder. He played cricket for West Indies in the 80s and 90s. I think he was a fast bowler. Yeah? A good one? Yeah. <laughs> good, I, I'm, yes. Well, I'm going to come to that second part in a minute. Yeah, that's not. So I'm just going to park Bamban Holder just to the side for time being. So EDI, if you've been following cricket, certainly for the past 18 months or so, uh, two years, EDI has become a big issue. In fact, the state of English cricket, as far as EDI is concerned, is shocking. And I choose my word very carefully. Yeah. It's really shocking because cricket is, cricket almost in its entire structure is dominated by people, by white um, people within a structure who are, whether it's administration, whether it's cricket, play, cricket teams, or whether it's backroom staff, or even the frontroom staff. Right? It's actually, there's a lot of deficiencies within the cricket structures. And all the EDI concerns have gone on deaf ears. And certainly the last 12 to 4, uh, 24 months, there's been much talk about racism uh, in cricket. But nobody has listened to the concerns which go back decades. This is not a new problem in, in cricket. This is going back to, certainly when I was growing up, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, um, I, I myself witnessed uh, many issues of racism, even in my own home county, Yorkshire. Okay? Now, it, it came to a head by Azim Rafiq. Uh, I don't know in the Midlands whether you followed Azim's story, but Azim Rafiq broke EDI of racism within or I, should I say institutionalized racism within Yorkshire County to the public domain. He was a very brave fellow. Yeah, he did not get, in the end, very much support from his own colleagues uh, who themselves suffered from racism. But in the end, he became a bit of a lone wolf. He was supported by certain members of the community. But in the end, he became very frustrated because he did not get as much support that he had hoped for. Uh, <clears throat> Many acclaimed cricketers have expressed concerns uh, uh, about racism within cricket. So let me just give you some quotes which are some of the cricketers. Ex-England uh, cricketer Michael Car Carberry? Carberry, yes. He said racism is rife in cricket. Yeah. John Holder and uh, Ismail Dawood, they've been in, uh, in the news lately. They've also accused um, ECB of institutionalized racism. Uh, Nasser Hussain, a really good Sky, a very balanced Sky commentator, he's actually said very recently, and I'm going to read you his quote, he says, the grim numbers of our county games show we have problems in desperate need of solving. Yeah. Another person, Michael Holding. Michael Holding, I don't know how many of you were watching cricket in the India against England in summer, but Michael Holding um, gave an interview to Jonathan Agnew in Test Match Special. And if you haven't listened to the interview, you should go on BBC iPlayer and listen to it because it's a bit of an eye-opener. He himself went through his whole history of cricket, how he faced racism within cricket. Yeah? And there's no bigger name than Michael Holding to voice those concerns. So you can see, and there are many, many more. I mean, I remember Imran Khan I wrote an article in The Guardian in the 1990s about cricket, particularly in my own co county. Um, and, and, and then the story, you just can carry on. <clears throat> but it's like it's been pointed out before. Why has it taken the ECB so long to do anything about it? I, uh, there was an article last year by the, the, the CEO of ECB, 
Tom Harrison. Tom Harrison said, we have a diversity problem in cricket. Now, this is the head of, C, uh, head of ECB. If he's saying this, why hasn't he done anything about it? Yeah? Because this is not a new problem. Yeah? As Duncan Stone has already highlighted, there are social issues, um, there are class issues, issues, there are race issues within cricket, but none of them has been fixed. So the problem is endemic, it's structural. A lot of people get confused about individuals being EDBI, EDI, non-compliant or racist. But really, it's not about individuals at the end of the day, although it is to some extent. It's about the structures. It's about the structures because racism or EDI or lack of EDI is embedded within those structures. Yeah, deeply embedded in some cases. And you've got to really dismantle those structures before you get any traction with uh, trying to solve racist issues. This is very important. Yeah? A lot of people just home in on individuals. No, you've got to look at the structures. And I know Tom Brown is sitting here, a um, colleague of mine here, he's done a PhD in that, and he's going to have, he's going to drill down a bit further into some of the findings he's done as part of his PhD. Mine is just a high-level overview of where we are in cricket. So, <clears throat> in a nutshell, if John Holder was the umpire, which he's not, he's retired now, but in his heydays, if I express these concerns in cricket, he would definitely give this out. Why? Because it's middle stun, right? It's the, the problem is so, so endemic and so widespread, spread, right, that there's no other reason but to give that an out. But I'm going to give you um, a bullet by bullet. I don't like reading bullets, but in this instance, I'm going to give you bullet by bullet, by bullet facts about where we are with EDI in English cricket. And I hope uh, you just pay attention and, and uh, focus on some of these. So there are 33 BAME. BAME is, uh, is, is the Black Asian Minority Ethnics. Some people don't like this term, but let's just call it BAME or BAME. There are only 33 BAME players currently of this summer played in, 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 the, in the 18 counties within the, the English and, and, and Wales cricket boards. Yeah. <coughs> now, some people think, well, there are 11 players by 18 counties. 18 times 11 gives you some figures, 190, 100, 200 plus. No, because there are more than, some counties can have 28 players because you've got the, the first class players, you've got the one day players, and then you've got other players as well. So you can see it's only a tiny fraction of BAME community is playing cricket in the counties. In the counties. This is where it gets very interesting because you're going to see some really shocking um, uh, <coughs> stats here. Four counties today have zero BAME player. A further four counties has only one. So out of the 18 counties, nearly half, the eight counties, have only one black an Asian minority ethnic player playing in the, in, in the, in the, in, in the uh, currently. Seven counties have no presence at the executive level. Now, you know, if you think the, where are decisions made? Decisions made at the board level, at the executive. The seven counties do not have any representation of BAME community at the executive level. <coughs> it gets worse. 12 out of 18 counties have zero black and ethnic minority coach. There are no coaches. Yeah, in 12, three quarters of the counties have no coaches. <sighs> it gets even more. I mean, Halloween is getting, you know, really getting quite interesting now. 41, so if you look at the ECB, uh, ECB comprises 18 counties, 21 minor counties, uh, one uh, national association of um, cricket association. So in total, there are 41 chairs that is comprised, that is managed by EB ECB. There are zero, currently there is zero chair in all of those cricketing bodies, uh, counties, minor counties, and one other, okay? Warwickshire and Yorkshire, it's interesting. Warwick and Yorkshire are, are, have this summer have only fielded one BAME player, BAME player, that was Adil Rashid. Now, a bit of a quiz time here. What's the population? I'm going to, because I'm from Leeds, 
I'm from Yorkshire, I know a bit more. And I'm gonna turn to our table over there. First, what's the population of black and ethnic minority community individuals, right, within Yorkshire, within, sorry, just Leeds and Bradford district? Any guesses, guys? How much? It's very close, very good. Anybody else? It's a very good guess, actually. Um, it's 275,000. Out of a population of 1.4 million, approximately, Leeds is about 850,000, mm -hmm. Bradford is about 550. 275,000 is the black, uh, black and Asians. Within that, about 200,000 are Asians alone, predominantly from Bradford, yeah? So only one player is actually featuring in the counties of Warwickshire and Yorkshire this year, in this summer. Shocking. So this is where our friend, I showed his picture earlier on, Bamban Holder comes in. He was the last guy, he was on the ECB's first class list of umpires, <clears throat> and he, 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 since 1992, 29 years have lapsed where we've not had a single umpire from black and Asian communities on the ECB first class list. Our own John Holder here, he resigned in, at the end of 2009 season, 2010, and uh, since then there has been no recruitment from the communities. Sorry? Two. Okay. Well, but Devon Market was rejected. Okay, so. Okay, well, we can maybe have that story after. So you can see the situation is quite a dire one, yeah? And at the moment, I can't see um, ECB or any of the county boards are serious enough to fix it. Yeah, there is some work going on in the background, and I'm hearing, uh, you know, they're serious about or at least the words are saying they're serious about fixing this problem which is facing cricket as a whole. And I don't think it's just cricket, but we're just focusing on cricket, so we'll just really go with cricket. <clears throat> so you can see the common thread that runs through this slide is there is virtually no, no representation in cricket from Brit the, the black and Asian community. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that damning, isn't that sad? Yeah, there is so much talent available. But, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Same lecture. Well, it's a, well, thank you for raising that point. So, <clears throat> how do we fix these issues? Well, I think it's all about change. But how do you bring about a change? As I said before, you can't bring about change by just uh, educating individuals. You know, we know conscious and unconscious bias exists in, I mean, in fact, unconscious bias exists in everybody. But you have to really move out of this into change the structures, yeah, all environments, right? That's backroom staff, front room staff, the administration, the executive, the players. The, the problem is widespread. It's, you, it's not just, you can't just hit one area. Can I just uh, finish this?
Mm-hmm. Well, <coughs> say no more. So I think what, what I'm getting at here is change is required in just about every sphere of c- cricket, yeah? Now, one of the things I'm very keen on, and I think the only way change happens is not through legislation or just mandating, okay? because that just ticks boxes. It's got to come, the change has to internalize. What do I mean by internalize? I mean, organization has to run proactively internal programs. Never mind what ECB says, never mind what British government says, right? We have to be compliant, we've got to be fair, yeah, and we've got to run these programs which are meaningful, yeah? And that's when change really starts to happen, when you want it to happen from your inner, not just for somebody knocking on your door and saying you haven't done this or you haven't done that. That's, what, that's, what's, that's the key thing. The other thing is about is, I've got a slide that says, make change as a business imperative. This is very important because from a business perspective, it makes a lot of sense to implement EDI in every organization. And I'm gonna give you five reasons why. Number one, clientele. Clientele is global now. Most organizations globally, they don't want, they want to see some diversity in the people they're dealing with, yeah? So from a business perspective, you will get more business. It's very important. Number two, <coughs> number two is productivity, yeah? If you, if you are just constantly battling against inequality or you're going to court or you're, your product, your, the, the productivity of your employees actually decreases. Yeah, it has a demotivational effect. Yeah, you don't have, you get sued, and it, it has much um, bearing on your reputation. That's number three. So your reputation goes down negatively. So it's important that as a business, you do not go down that line. Number four is about growth. What's growth? Growth is about growth, growing individuals. Growth is about growing community. Yeah, communities grow through cohesion, through working together, not through isolation. I think Duncan Stone has already highlighted some of the stuff about uh, social inhibition or social deprivations, which are cause of some of the stuff that's coming through. Why is that? Why don't we include every working classes, non-working classes, you name it. It's about the holistic re- approach. It's about making everyone respected. So that's why I think change is required. It is time for change, I believe. Yeah. So when Z started this, one, one minute. When Z started this, um, we put together a model. How do we, how as this little group, or potentially a group that's going to grow, hopefully, in, into the rest of the UK. How are we gonna make, how, what's our model? So we've got a model here which is, which is all about connecting with our communities. It's not just about cricket, connecting from a, with the businesses, connecting with the, creating a hub for physical activities, um, academia, you know, having some training centers, yeah? And also connecting, um, but the whole thing has to be underpinned by some intelligent data. So what we propose to do is, is we need to create something intelligent. We live in, you know, data democratization is happening all over, yeah? So we need to use the data that's available, and we need to make that data transparent so that an organization can be held accountable, so we can publish it. So it's no longer hidden under the carpet. We we need to make it visible to everyone. This is our model, and I hope, you know, in the future, it's not too long, we can come together and reunite the communities. Thank you very much. (laughs) Who's the next speaker? Oh, Tom. (laughs) Sorry, I forgot Tom. How can I forget Tom? Tom, Tom is a, let me just give you a quick introduction to Tom. Um, um, I came to know Tom uh, a few months back, last year I think probably, last year. Tom is doing a PhD in uh, Warwick University and he's done um, a lot of study, a 
about the inequalities, the, the social impact of cricket, the race impact of cricket. And uh, Tom has got some very, very interesting graphs and data to share. So please welcome Tom Brown. Hello. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, firstly, uh, thanks for the introduction. My name's Tom. Uh, and as just mentioned, I've been researching for the last three or four years uh, the journeys of ethnic minority players through the professional game uh, as it stands at the moment. Um, I've never done this presentation with not having my laptop in front of me, so I'm going to have to do break the rule of presenting and look away from you at times. But um, what I would like to do to start with is it, try and draw your attention away from looking at me uh, and looking up there. Um, to start with, just painting the picture of what's going on um, in our professional teams in a minute. And just before I do that, um, my PhD was funded by Warwickshire County Cricket Club, Essex County Cricket Club, and the ECB, um, and, is, and by Birmingham City University. Um, and I say this, and I, the irony of who I am and what I look like isn't lost on me that I'm a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white guy uh, talking about EDI. Um, but it, hopefully it presents that I don't have any hidden agenda up here that I don't have any, what I'm saying is the uh, objective findings from my study and actually funded by the counties themselves. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll go through them. Um, so oh, just a, the main focus of my research was around the British South Asian um, players, but uh, I do have data and stuff around the, uh, the, the black British community. However, for time, I know we're way behind on that schedule anyway, so uh, we'll, we'll go through. Um, so from the UK census in uh, 2011, uh, roughly 3.2 million uh, people from, were British South Asian in, in the country, which equated to about 5.7% of the population. Uh, and this number has definitely grown and is predicted to carry on growing uh, and will be around about 6 million by 2031. Um, in recreational cricket, so you know, playing for fun, uh, British South Asians uh, represent 30% of the demographic uh, across the country and in core cities, so Birmingham, Manchester, etc. that's actually as high as 57%. Um, oh, I missed the point there. Going too quick. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, the British South Asian community contribute over £120 million uh, pounds towards uh, the cricketing economy, which is about 18%. And those findings are actually not from myself, they're from the ECB's action plan um, themselves. So now we can go. <laughs> um, the main reason for my study was actually around this graph. So in the past uh, 10 years, the representation of British South Asian players in the professional game has declined by 40%. Uh, for the black British community since the year 2002, it's declined by 75%. Um, the current, on top of that, the current um, cohort of players that we have, 20% of them are over the age of 32. So you know, within the next three to four years, if we were to continue that graph, they're likely to have retired. I don't want to write anybody off, they might carry on playing for a long time, but they're probably likely to have retired uh, or certainly going that way. So we're in a situation where we need to start running with programs to just stand still. So what we did for my study was we looked at everything in regards to who is funding, like who is, sorry, going into professional cricket. Um, mm -hmm. And we basically looked at every single player on a CAG program, which is a county age group program, so under 10 to under 19, and we looked at, um, which was over 4,000 players and the professional cohort uh, at the moment, which is 370 players, and we split them into three groups, 10s to 15s, and then 16s to 19s. And what we did was we compared those under 10s to under 19s with the regionalized norms for each demographic. So it, it's unfair sometimes to say things like, oh, you don't have any vain players, you don't have any representation. What, what we need to do is look at what the representation of each community is and how does our teams reflect that in the, in the community. Um, what we did with the, so that's what we compared the under 10 to under 19 data with. With the, unders, uh, with the professional teams, what we did is we said, here's your talent pathway, here's your under 10s to under 19s, what, this is the demographic of them, what does your professional team look like and how does that reflect? And we did this for schooling, so the school types they attended, uh, whether it be private school or state school, and we did it for, obviously, ethnicity. So the results of the ethnicity study were the British South Asian players across every single region, under 10 to under 15, were actually overrepresented. So, which is a good thing, so that we see that um, compared to the demographic of each region, 
uh, the county age group pathways under 10 to under 15 saw an over-representation of British South Asian players. However, there was an under-representation of black British players in all regions except the North East and the South West where they were evenly represented. Um, nationally, with that statistic, you are 80% more likely to be selected for a county age group program if you're white than if you're black at, at that age group. Again, at under 16 to under 19, again, British South Asian players were overrepresented uh, in everywhere except the North East and the North West where they dropped to evenly represented. Black players actually became more evenly represented apart from in West Midlands and London where they remained significantly underrepresented. And this was the main point for my study which I mentioned earlier. When it then came to the transfer to professional cricket, British South Asian players experienced a massive flip to then go from being overrepresented to significantly underrepresented at professional cricket to the point where, uh, sorry, and that was across every region except for the East, which is Essex, um, to the point where, um, oh no, no, sorry, go, go forward. Uh, this is now the trajectory for a British South Asian player. Um, I should again. So at under 10 to under 15, you can see it's around about 20%. Uh, and under 16 to uh, 19, again, near enough 20%, 18.7. And then it drops off a cliff uh, to less than 5% at the professional level. And the reason I highlight this, and I, I think it's really important, is there are some, whenever we talk about EDI and whenever we talk about engagement, all of it is always pushed towards engagement and increasing numbers for participation and recreational cricket and getting players into county pathways. And whilst that's certainly noble and something we, we can need to continue to do, at the moment, our talent development systems are in a position where we can throw as much at it as we like. There's a serious problem happening in our talent programs where talented ethnic minority players aren't converting from a program to professional cricket. So we did again the results for schooling. Um, so yeah, we had 370 players. Uh, we removed everyone who received a scholarship because it's obviously not fair to compare a scholar student to a regular student because the scholar student's obviously a good cricketer. Um, and what we did was we compared, again, the norms uh, in each region to what was out there. And what we did from that was we created odds, something called odds ratios. And an odds ratio identifies one demographic and compares it to another demographic and says what were the likelihood of both of those, dem of each of those demographics becoming a professional cricketer. Um, and from that, just to give an example of what odds ratios are, the Delta COVID variant, uh, which everyone was worried about being more contagious than the last variant in the summer, uh, was between 1.8 times and 4.1 times more contagious. So the odds ratio is between 1.8 and 4.1. The odds, the likelihood of you getting lung cancer from smoking is between 5.6 and 14 times more likely compared to non-smoking. So you're f roughly 15 times more likely to get lung cancer if you smoke than if you don't smoke. If you're white and play, go to a private school compared to if you are white and go to a state school, you're 12.8 times more likely to become a professional cricketer. If you are white and go to private school compared to if you are Asian and go to state, state school, you are 34 times more likely to become a professional cricketer uh, than, uh, sorry, if you are white and privately educated to state um, and British South Asian represented. So, you can see how big a scale an issue we're looking at, and it puts into context how big a decline that is. Some people might look at the previous graph and go, well, it's a big decline, but that puts in more real, real world view. Um, when we remove ethnicity and we just simply look at schooling, I break this down regionally, um, and you can see the odds ratios in each region uh, for how likely you are to become a professional cricketer if you go to private school and state school, and you can see um, here in the East Midlands, we're 22 times more likely to become a professional cricketer if you went to private school than state school, regardless of ethnicity. Um, so, yeah. So, what I've tried to do with that is then answer all the questions that get thrown at me as to why this happens. Um, there are lots of stereotypes to go through. I, I can't summarize four years' worth of research in five minutes, so apologies, I will skip over a few things, but I'm sure there's a Q&A later. Um, so if we go through for the ethnicity, the first thing that always gets thrown is that you have to be good enough, and that is a fair criticism that uh, cricket, or like any sport, should be a meritocracy, that if you have to be good enough to actually play the game to become a professional, regardless of skin color. So what we did was we took 250 players and we retrospectively tracked their performance analysis data 
over a 15-year period. So there was roughly 55% white, 45% Asian in this sample. Uh, and what we found, again, uh, this is a big study, but I'll summarize it, was that uh, academy batters, so Asian academy batters uh, were actually outperforming white academy batters. However, eight white lads were signed and only two Asian lads were signed. Um, there was no difference between bowling data at all. Uh, and nine white British bowlers were signed and no Asian bowlers were signed. And on top of that, uh, two Asian bowlers within this sample were actually the leading wicket takers in their counties' respective uh, second 11s, and neither of those guys were given contracts. And I know that that can be, that doesn't include every single player, it's a large sample, but like I said, there were 4,000 players before. Um, but certainly from our study, we've, to conclude, we found no evidence to suggest that performances on the pitch throughout the pathway are the reason for that massive decline or drop off. So the stereotypes that always get thrown at me for Asian cricketers are Asian cricketers aren't fit enough. And to be fair, with that stereotype, when we compared within that, that sample uh, Asian cricketers to white cricketers, uh, overall, white cricketers were fitter or scored higher on fitness scored. However, the academy players, the light players who were most likely to be signed, uh, they were actually fitter than, than the white players. So again, it kind of dispels that myth. The other one was British South Asian players all want to go to university and become doctors and lawyers. Um, <laughs> but from 2008 to 2020, and again, this could just be within the sample we had, it might not be national, um, only 18% of the academy players uh, went to university compared to 50% of the white uh, players went to university. So again, that's not a legitimate excuse for why these guys aren't getting through. What we believe we found, um, is this notion of individualism versus collectivism and what we look for as professional county pathways in our ideal professionals. So individualism is effectively refers to cultures that emphasize individual responsibility, choice, and value traits to our usually curiosity, creativity, assertiveness, articulate communicating, and self-esteem. Whereas collectivists refer to individuals that, prefer, that have more of a group identity and is typically more seen in Asian and Aboriginal cultures where uh, decision making often happens as a family, younger members uh, look to take the advice of elders and confrontations and challenges to authority are seen as a negative or, or even disrespectful. Real world examples from other literature, um, and this was in education, uh, eye contact, I, I realise I might be preaching to the choir here so you might already know a lot of this but it's uh, eye contact, not making eye contact and looking down being more a sign of respect than looking up in the eyes of the coach and challenging. Um, asking questions uh, and challenging authority is more of a collective, sorry, an individualistic trait than a collectivist trait. Silence, so not having to respond when you're spoken to. Um, and in short, there's, there's thousands of these traits that are different between uh, Asian and um, uh, westernized cultures. But effectively, what we've identified is that these differences get misinterpreted for acts of defiance or a lack of interest and intelligence when they're not, that they're simply different ways of showing respect in different cultures uh, within, or different uh, norms within culture. Uh, so, yeah, we move on. So just to put into perspective the differences between the cultures, um, this graph up here uh, was a study done in 2018 which effectively ranked how individualistic na uh, nations were. Uh, so if you're at the top of that list, you're very individualistic, and if you're at the bottom, uh, you're very collectivist. And you can see, if we go through the first four, the blue here, the United Kingdom, Australia, and South Africa, four test-playing nations are, uh, oh, oh, two seconds, I'll come, um, are heavily individualistic. Um, when we then go through further from that, you see uh, India is becoming more westernized with its growing economy, but you also see Pakistan, Trinidad and Tobago, and Bangladesh indicating they're more collectivists at the other end of that graph. And then when we look where do we get all our best coaches from or where are all the coaches hired from, um, the majority of them in the IPL, the Big Bash 100 and even at test level are from the four countries that I've highlighted in blue at the start. Uh, further, where do we get all our education, our um, literature from? Where do we listen to all the, from a science perspective? It's from these countries, again, all in the first half. So there's an argument to be made, and this is what I'm researching at the moment, is, to, is there a bias towards collective, sorry, individualistic approaches uh, as opposed to collectivist cultures, which basically makes it 
um, our county programs significantly um, ignorant or, or lacking the knowledge on how to deal with different communities. Yes. Sorry. What, da what data? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, and that's where, you know, the, the sense of Englishness, that, that my research has touched a lot of that uh, with things that... I mean, I, I don't mind the, the gentleman's comment at all. I mean, it's, it's it, what we, the, sometimes the, the irony of being an academic or a PhD is that people take your word for gospel and they're not challenged. And, you know, thank you for you know, bringing up the points you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and that's good to you, man. Like, you know, there's, there are certain things. That, and, and definitely Harringate College is a really, really interesting case study for... Yeah, fair enough. Um, or, but the only thing left from me was just to talk about the, the qualitative side of my research where we've, we've gone out and interviewed players, past and current players, as to what's having, what's going on. Uh, and all of the themes, again, long study, but just to summarize, was a confirmation of lacking of understanding around culture, um, 
reinforcement the game is not meritocratic and reasons for not being selected are usually seen as excuses as opposed to being constructive feedback for not being selected. Uh, strong examples of differential treatment, which we can go through. Um, feelings that British South Asian players have to do more than white players was pervasive throughout, uh, and my performance data backs that up. Um, too much of an emphasis of things that aren't cricket, so in a lot of academies you find yourselves doing presentations and uh, how you come across in team meetings, etc., and basically things that aren't real performances on the pitch. Um, there needs to be more support from the transition from something like Parks League cricket uh, into professional cricket, so guys who are really successful in different environments get shoved into these performance environments where they're told, you know, you have to be here at this time, this is your diet, this is your weight program, these are the overs you've got to bowl, and it's quite a huge change, uh, and the support needs to be greater through that. Um, there were actually few reportings of actual racial abuse, but what's interesting about that is a lot of them would say, no, I've never experienced racism, and then go on to talk about all the times that they experienced racism, so it was, it was, it was quite interesting. Um, uh, and as well, parents being key figures in a child's development, uh, and potentially far more than white players, about how counties can engage parents probably more uh, was an interesting fact. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. Guys, I hope that that starter is just about digesting right now in your bodies. And uh, we're going to do a bit of a question and answer here, right? Uh, right now. So I want every table there, the captain, put your hands up, captain, right, on every table, right? Captain over there. Right, guys, John, I'd like you to join us here on the table here. Chris, we'd like you to join you here, join us here, right? And I see, I, I want all of you to look around this hall and see if you recognize anybody of significance here. Have a look around, look around each table. Tom, Tom, you're the star man, come. Right guys, there's no issues of inclusion, diversity on my stage. You can see here, we got it sorted. We got everybody's back. We got 40 diversities to look after, right? So we're gonna look, take care of everybody, right? So now, there's one guy, look around. Anybody spot anybody out of the ordinary? Yeah? Come on, look, 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 look behind you. All the tables are behind you, all of you at the front. Don't look at me, look behind you. Yeah? Right, there's the first question I've asked you all, that you have all failed the test of recognizing anybody who is in the news right now. I'd like Mr. Azim Rafiq to join us here at the front and take a seat over there. Right, before we start this question and answers, we want nothing but the truth, but the truth costs money. So I want all of you to tell me if you want to hear a lie or do you want to hear a truth? Truth, everybody's up for the truth. So we're going to do a little auction here as to how much you're going to pay, starting with Lily. All this money that I collect today is going to go to your charity, the Leicester Children's Hospital. Right, guys? State-of-the-heart hospital in Leicester. Right? So we're going to start the bidding now on all your tables. Who is going to pay some money down for the truth? How about this table, Captain? How much are you bidding for the truth? It don't come for free. 100 pounds, anybody gonna beat that? Birmingham, come on. Birmingham, don't let Manchester beat you. What about you? Leeds, Bradford? I knew it, as soon as the food comes, everybody switched off. Right, we'll start. I'll give you money, it'll be Uganda shillings. Ugandan shillings, no, no, we need the British pound. We're living in England, we need the British pound. None of those jokes here, please. Leave the jokes to me. One million, you can't right. Okay, 
I'm going to start with table, Manchester table. Captain, I want you all know all of you've been nattering here, right? So I want you to ask a question, right? Don't ask me because I don't have the answers, but one of the speakers here will answer. Right, guys, listen, listen to the question. First of all, uh, that fantastic day. Congratulations for organizing this. I guess what I've picked up throughout the evening is this element of change. It's come up from you, it's come up from Farag's talk. But change, you know, ECB, the governing body that we're talking about, is such a juggernaut, such a, you know, it's a, to move them is so difficult. We've tried last year, we've approached them, we've spoke with Tom Harrison, we've spoke with various people, but, you know, they speak a good game, but when it comes down to execution, they're just a waste of time. Today, you know, we're talking about the converted. People here all have suffered or have had some issues. But how do we get the message across to the ECB? On the panel there, we've got some esteemed guests who have some interaction with the ECB. In their opinion, how do we take this message to the ECB? Thank you very much for that. Who would like to answer that on the panel there? John? Cricket in this country, um, originally, the, the, the governing of cricket in this country, the running of cricket in this country, started with the MCC. The MCC is a private members club, and it was started by a bunch of wealthy old white men. And they made decisions and no one challenged them. And over the years, the MCC, um, it, it morphed into, it became the TCCB, which is responsible for the running of professional cricket. And, no, and they've done things over the years. It, be, it became the, MC, the ECB in the early 2000s. And they, they've been able to run the game and no one has ever challenged what they've done. And that's the problem, that's been the problem. So there's a massive arrogance that they can do as they like. As, as someone said tonight, as Mohammed over there said tonight, um, between 2009 and 2017, they received something like 70, you know, almost, 70 million pounds from Sport England, which was part of which was to go towards diversity, providing diversity, and they haven't. Now, I umpired for, for a long time and, and enjoyed it, and after retirement, I re I re during my time, I realized that it was potentially a good um, career for young, youngsters. And I retired in 2009, and then I realized after the Michael Holding um, um, impassioned speech last year, and they started looking at the treatment of black people. And I realized, and I found out then that Devon Malcolm, former England player uh, from Jamaica, former Derbyshire, Northamptonshire player, in 2005, having finished um, playing, he had actually phoned an official at the ECB in the Cricket Operations Department and made inquiries about being trained to become a first-class umpire. And he was dissuaded and told not to bother because they don't have any vacancies. But, in the s but at the same time, the manager of the um, umpire's manager in the ECB was taking on white boys who had played cricket in for, Eng um, for the counties. And none of them had played at international level which Devon had played. And I, I was, when, I f when I heard about that, I was so annoyed because I thought, this is a man who went to the West Indies in 1991 with England, knocked over the Great Bridges in the Jamaica Test, and he was, he, was, he was called a hero. Three years later, in 1994, he bowled South Africa out at the Oval, got nine for 50 odd, was, was called a hero. And now he's retired, and he can't even get the opportunity to see if he was good enough to become a first-class umpire is only for white boys. So last November, um, Ishmael Dawood and I, through Mohammed from Heaven and Help, uh, Heaven, Heaven Help Us, we took legal action against the ECB. But our, our aim really was to shame the ECB by making public information that was not known to the public. And that happened, and of course, the, the developed the, the um, siege mentality, and they just kept the head below 
it's perfect, but it's been, what has been happening at Lord's within the ECB is, in my opinion, racist. Absolutely racist. Right, uh, John. ECB, PCB, TCB, so many Bs everywhere, right? So we're going to deal with that later. So let's go now. I need a captain to put his hand up who wants to ask a question because some of you are immersed in your food and I can't compete with the stomach, right? I can take you on in the mind but not in the stomach. So who's brave enough here now to take me on and my panel here? Who's going to ask you a question, right? Are you... The, I want the captain there, table, Bangladesh. Let's have it. Let's have the question. Now, you know what? We are challenged now. Now we are talking some serious inclusion where we have women involved in the cricket game, which I'm very happy about, right? <laughs> While I'm around, there's going to be hundreds more women joining the game of cricket in Leicester. Fingers crossed. Um, thank you all for um, all your fantastic words. It's really interesting to hear your um, research, uh, Tom. It's quite stark, some of the data. Um, what I wanted to know is all of the facts p point to one thing, that there is structural racism in the sport, like many other areas. But what would your advice be to a young kid who goes to a non-private school and who is a BAME, black or Asian? What would your advice be to them trying to come up in that sport, despite all these factors kind of uh, acting against them? A question here for Chris. You're the right man for this one, Chris. The same one as probably your parents give you. Work really hard. You'll probably likely have to be twice as good. Um, it's the truth of the matter. We've spoken about, or you've heard the research. Um, we've all had our own personal experience. But here and now, that's the reality. We've all heard about change and a, a lack of willingness on the part of the board to perhaps change and that total um, inclusion. And when you look at all of that, the only thing that you can say is that you're going to have to work really hard. You're going to have to be dedicated um, because the facts are the facts as they stand. So as a young person, I would say that your dreams and your hopes and all of that, you can still achieve it, but you're going to have to work really hard for this one. Yeah, yeah just right. to jump Here on that. We one. Have a, uh, yeah, just to add to that, um, we had a saying in our research thing about talent breaking the mold. So you, you can, as Chris says, get there, but you almost have to be twice as good, and that's why guys like Moeen and uh, Adil make it all the way to the top, and the, and the England team looks quite diverse because the best get there, but, the, but you have to be the best to get there. So I don't have an answer in terms of, you know, if in short, you, it shouldn't be this way. It should be a meritocracy. I don't have an answer for how to fix that from a player's point of view. So that's what I'm trying to do is go to the counties and fix it from that way around so that players, it is a meritocracy from the, from the county's point of view, but, but there's quite a lot of work to do before that. And... Like Chris said, I guess the only advice to be right now is to be at the absolute best and be, be twice as good, I'm afraid. I think, uh, first and foremost, um, thanks for the question. It's a really difficult one. If I understand right, what you're saying is, what advice would you give to a young player? Now, saying to a young player, you have to work twice as hard to have a chance of getting through, uh, can actually be quite a negative, um, so you've already planted that seed in his head, so it's a, it's a really difficult one, you want to give him reality, but if you give him reality at a young age, 11, 12 year old, then you get told, if you, uh, you want to get through anywhere, you're going to have to work twice as, uh, as hard, but even then you might not have a chance. Um, I feel like it's more the support network around the kids, uh, I think in a way we've got to try and let them get in the environment, but make sure we're there for them a lot more. Um, and the support network is the most important thing. Knowing Adil very close, he's got an incredible support network. So when these things happen, it's that sort of stuff that gets you through it. But I mean, I'm a parent now and saying to my son, oh, if you, if you 
have a chance, if you want a chance to get through, you've got to work twice as hard. I don't really know if that's going to help a kid anyway. So it's, to be honest, instead of saying stuff to the kid, we need to actually stand together and make a difference and change the structures. Because we can't keep going back to the players, to the kids, and expect them to do stuff. It's the institutions and the leaders that need to earn their salaries and do more. Right, can I get a word in here? Permission of the panel? Yes, I know I'm not qualified, but yeah, hands up please, so it's on tape. We don't want any problems afterwards. That's okay guys, here we are. What I'm gonna say to you all is that change is never gonna happen. We are the change. We all have to be the change that we want to see in England or anywhere else in the world, right? We all have to come together, get on the table, if we can't sort it out ourselves, then we can't blame anybody else, right? So that's what I got to say on that point, is we all, today I'm so proud to see so many different communities here, right? Now, next time I do this event, they'll all be sitting together, mixed, right? That's what the diversity is all about. Thank you. Next question from table number. Please identify yourself. Yeah, if you can take the mic to the gentleman over there. Your name, please. I don't know your name. I want the world to know your name. Britain means something to my kids. And I like my kids to mean something to Britain. And when we look at things like sports diplomacy, if we look at cricket, it really showcases what Britishness is. My biggest issue is, from everything that's been spoken about, is saying, do we actually represent Britain? Because that's the fact of it. Cricket has to represent the multiculturalism of what the country is offering. But if they're failing to do so, are we not actually turning that point, like you mentioned, about what Britishness truly represents? Because that's the bottom line of it, isn't it? We don't see it happening in any other sport as much, especially for the Asian community, but we are seeing it in cricket. So what would you be able to do in terms of galvanizing your voices in that in Leicester or London or other areas? to actually really, really look at what this notion of Britishness is to the immigrant experience, especially in particular to that of sport. Thank you. So, okay, can you give him the mic? Right, before, right, before you make your point, I'd like to make a point, one, one minute, one minute. Right, I think I want to find that table over there. Uh, that is, what county is it? Which county is it? That England? County? County? Warwickshire. 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 I'm going to find that table, 100 pounds. That money will go straight to the mayor's charity. Are we all good for that? Yes. Right? Okay, now, respectfully, ask your question. If you want to teach, if, if, if if you want some impact from today, a little bit further there, you've got to go back and read the history books. That's where you learn. Not the future, because the future doesn't tell you about the wrongs of the past. Right? Peter Obon plays for our cricket club. And until you don't read the De Oliveira affair written by Peter Obon, you will not understand the nuances of English cricket and what English and cricket means. That's the first thing. What you have to understand is this. The Women's Trophy, what's it, who's it named after? Anybody know who's, who's it named after? The, the Rachel Hayhoe Plint Trophy, correct? You aware of that, Zed? No, I'm not aware of that. Anybody was here? Tom, Tom right. is aware of that. You aware of it, Tom? The Women's Trophy. So you're a historian. You're a historian, correct? Yeah, you're a historian. So what did Rachel Hayhorn Plint do in the 1970s crisis between the England cricket team or the MCC team and the South African team? What did she actually do when the crisis was ongoing? She raised money for the apartheid South African team because they lost money because they couldn't come to the United Kingdom. Were you aware of that? You're not aware of that? So we've got a, a leading figure at the MCC, many years on, maybe 50 years on, they reward her and 
name a major trophy after the lady who actually stood up and said, there's nothing wrong with apartheid cricket and the white South African team, and I'm going to actually start raising money for them along with my MCC members. Were you aware of that, my friend? Were you aware of it? No. No, you weren't aware of it. That's just real history, my friend. Of yeah, course. Just, just to be what, really what clear. That, that's, that's real history. Just to be really clear. Right. My, my so let, let me make my point, my friend. One solution will be reverse engineering. Like the England cricket team has had many white South Africans, Kiwis, agree or disagree. In your statistics, my friend, tell me how many black South Africans were playing under Colpac. How many black South Africans played under Colpac? None. None. How many white South Africans played was, was, hang on, hang under on. Ash, Colpac? Ash, Ashwell Prince was one, wasn't he? Yeah, it? no, no, in terms of percentages. Very little. 99% white South African versus 1% black South African, correct? Okay, right, right, listen, guys. Correct? We've got to keep yeah. a question only, not a story. Right, so no, 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 no. it's just important. No, 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 no. no you need no, to ask a question. No, no, no. I'm going to ask you a question. So why did your research not cover lots of Kiwis and South Africans who are in scholarships in English independent schools? And it why did your research not look at Colpac? My research did look at Colpac. I just gave a 15-minute summary of three and a half years' worth of research, which will be published and you will be have access to. If you can give me your email at the end, I'll send it directly to you. You haven't read it because it hasn't been published. Yeah. Okay. Right, guys, when I say a question, I need a question, not a story. Right? Now, I clearly understand... Right. One, let me just finish that. I clearly understand what he's saying. He's talking about the YTT. Put your hand up if you know what it means, the YTT. See, I am blessed with, uh, I don't have a clue, diverse community here today, right? I don't have a clue. YTT, what he's talking about, it's yesterday. The Y stands for yesterday, T stands for today, and the other T stands for tomorrow. So what he's saying, if we don't learn from our lessons of yesterday, about the history of yesterday, we ain't going to make it better today, and we're not going to make it better tomorrow. Guys, what do you say to that? Okay. There's so much that could be said by everybody on this topic, but at the end of this, listen, change always happens with the people who want change, or it starts with the people who want change, and that would be us. Now, we talk a lot, or I've heard a lot of stuff about the ECB and so many things, and for sure, a lot of those things may well be right, and we all understand how that causes pain, but ultimately, um, change comes with us, about, uh, with us, yeah, sticking together, yeah, and building from there. Um, there's something that I've said, and a couple of people have said tonight, that people come to you when you have something to offer. And that's always been the case. So it's for us to get our stuff in order, yeah, and things will change, but change starts with us, how we, how we do stuff. Um, tonight I've heard so much stuff about the ECB, but I'll be perfectly honest, um, it's a little disheartening because all I'm hearing is that in order for things to get better, somebody else has to do something. Um, I've never really heard that in life, really. Normally, it starts with us. Yeah? Um, I just thought I'd say. I think just following on from what Chris has just said and just from a personal experience of what I'm going through right now, it's so easy to sit on a table whinge and moan about this, that, the other. And I've seen this over the last 14 months. I can categorically tell you, and this is something that I'll speak in a lot more detail in the future, the biggest support, help Yorkshire County Cricket Club has received in my case, in my situation, has been from people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. 
it's been from people from my own background. Whether we like it or we don't like it, I might upset people in here. The simple fact is, most people, most community organizations that have been helping businesses, individuals that have been helping Yorkshire County Cricket Club are from my own background. So it's all well and good pointing fingers at other people. When we had an opportunity to do something, no one believed me. And that's what we don't do. We don't believe our own. No one stood up. Everyone was more bothered about their own businesses, their own statuses, their own egos, and their own money. That is the fact. That is what I'm living right now. So I'm sick and tired. And I've, I've, I've sat on table with people. They've talked to really good game. When it comes to the crunch, no one stands up. Until we do, we're not going to get respect. That is as simple as that. Right, as, as we are doing this uh, Q&A, lots of messages are coming in from our social media, right? And I, I am a little bit very sad to read some of them, right? And I'll, I don't want to share them with you because they are long. So I, I can see people are very, very passionate about what's going on, but I'm going to give you a quick one here. Once somebody sent me a message here, nobody's going to care what bank balance you leave behind, but even if you change one small thing for the better, I'll ring out for generations. Change does not happen because people are too busy pursuing their own selfish interests. And humanity or a related cause is not a priority, then I don't know what it is. A common teaching has to be taught to everybody. It is absolutely crazy. It is a tenant of every religion to work together. So it's very sad, you know, some very sad messages I'm getting here. The problems are ring, generally linked to egoism and selfishness. What can I do for us, but what can I do for me? That's what the messages are coming in. So we all have to pay attention to this. It's very sad. It's very sad, you know. And I hear him, what he's saying, that he's saying that his own community did not come forward to support him, right? Now, his own community, what community is he? Is he Pakistani? Is he Indian? Is he West Indian? Is he Bangladeshi? Is he Sri Lankan? What's going on? It's absurd. When you see wrongdoing, it should not be about what is your community, what is your sect, what's your religion. Everybody should come forward. Why does it have to take Michael Holding to say words on Sky Sports before everybody wakes up? I'm telling you all, you all here, sat here today, are here to make change. And if you don't do so, your children, you will have done a disservice to them, right? And they will be cursing all of you, right? So come on, please, guys, wake up. Wake up, dress up, and show up on time. That's what we teach in our business. Let's do the same for cricket. Let's all wake up, dress up with some knowledge and some facts and some data. Brother is said about yesterday, today, tomorrow. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. All of you guys here today, take this message home, pass it on to your communities, to your brothers, to your sisters, to your boss, and change will happen. Otherwise, you're all going to fry with 40 diversities. You're going to build your mosque, you're going to build your mandir, you're going to build whatever uh, place of worship you're going, and that ain't going to change your community alone. We need community, community, community support with the amenities that we are talking about here today. Right, sorry guys, got a little bit carried away. Right. This question here from Captain on our table from England, Leicestershire. The politician's table. It's been an eye-opener. Uh, what I've learned this evening uh, has shocked me. Uh, I am a person that has avoided all forms of sport from the day I left school. But even I used to watch the test matches until they were taken off Telestra television. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes the rulers of cricket ever made, to, to put it on Sky and make an elitist group of people the only ones to watch it. But the question I want to ask is, uh, going back to that gentleman there, your figures. I'd like to know what are the figures regarding uh, BAME uh, players in Leicestershire? How does Leicestershire fit into this picture? We heard about Yorkshire, we've heard about Warwickshire. What's Leicester doing about it? Because it's the community I live in and we all live in. So if we can persuade something to happen locally, it may be the start to improving things. 
from a schooling perspective, um, the East Midlands and, and Leicester as part of it were, had one of the highest rates of dis uh, disparity between private school and state school in the country. So pri Leicestershire County Cricket Club rely a lot on uh, or have turn turned in recent years to private schooling, probably m even more so than the likes of other um, schools that were mentioned before uh, in Somerset and um, in London. Uh, from an ethnicity perspective, um, the, m the point I tried to make with those graphs is, is no one's doing very well. Um, and, uh, well, e Essex are doing okay, um, but other than that, no one's doing very well. So I think, I think if memory serves, you know, I can get the, I've literally got my laptop there, I can show you personally where Leicester, I think mid-table in regards to uh, transfer of Asian cricketers from their pathway to professional cricket. Um, but even that, sometimes it's identifying which of those cricketers actually came through Leicester's pathway and which are products of other pathways that have been brought in uh, as well. So that's a different analysis in itself. So probably a little bit more vague than I would have liked as a response, um, but I can go through it with you on my laptop when I've got the numbers in front of me off the, instead of guessing off the top of my head. Um, thanks. Just a quick one. Um, we take light-hearted questions too. During the last 10, 11 months or so, with um, Ishmael Dawood and I had this um, c case against the ECB. And the Guardian newspaper was very supportive. The Guardian is supposed to be a very good investigative paper. And one of the, one of the journalists at the, at the, of the Guardian, who has, is a member of a county club in London, said that he is ashamed that this club is more concerned with maintaining, with being a white club. So all the players, they're looking to, we, to um, they're looking to South Africa. Lots of South African belong to this club because the, cl the club wants the, wants the team to be predominantly white. So they look to South Africa and there are lots of South Africans. That's the reality. He said he's, he said he's actually ashamed to be a member of Middle, well, Middlesex because of this South African bias where they're looking to recruit players. That's the reality. Thank you for that, John. The question here from, uh, is that a Yorkshire table? Is that Yorkshire? Oh, I can see some trouble coming my way now. I've got to be ready for that. Hi. Hello, uh, this is a question from Azim Rafiq. Uh, good to see you, Azim, here. Zim, I would just want to ask you, the Yorkshire C C uh, the County Cricket Board has now announced that they are not going to take any action against their employees who have been named in the report which came out. So what do you do, how do you feel about it? Uh, what are you going to do about it now? Next steps? How do I feel about it? Um, I don't think uh, Yorkshire's handling of all this has been a very good um, PR example for anyone to follow. That's the first. Um, I don't really know what they're playing at, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, they first said that I was the victim of inappropriate behavior. Two weeks later, they said there was no question that I was a victim of racial harassment and bullying. And suddenly, I think two months later, they, in the press release, they were congratulating themselves and how proud they are about how they've conducted the whole thing. Where it's going to go, I don't know. I mean, just to give a little bit of understanding of how this whole investigation worked, Yorkshire employed and paid for some lawyers. Then Yorkshire got a group of panel together, predominantly from a BAM background. Then the lawyers did an investigation, sent it back to the panel, and then Yorkshire decided what they were going to put out to the public. So it's a very diluted process. Um, I can tell you it wasn't independent at all. Um, a senior figure at Yorkshire himself told a journalist that it's not been very independent, but they've effectively marked their own homework and still failed. Um, and they still think it's all right to, that no one uh, is going to get disciplined. There seems to be a narrative from them that 
Um, it was all in the past, and um, it's not now, and it's everything's great. That's that's a complete lie. Um, there is things that obviously I can't say, uh, which will become very evident clearly, but one thing that's not going to happen is I'm not going anywhere. So if they want to carry on fighting, um, I will keep fighting, and I'll fight to the end, because regardless... Regardless of wh whether I'm stood there on my own or with 20 other people, the truth will never change. Um, and the big thing of all of this is there's a lot other people as well that went through it and go through it. It's not just Yorkshire. It's not just Yorkshire. Go to Birmingham. Uh, highly populated. You ask them a question why they've got no Asians on their professional staff. Yeah, but 50% of our academy is Asians. Well, that makes it even worse. You go to Manchester, London, two clubs. Nowhere. There's a reason for that. Uh, we all keep going to the grassroots, grassroots, grassroots. We don't have a problem at grassroots. Tom's data, we live in a, in a society now that data is everything. Tom's data is just, it's reality. We don't have a problem at grassroots level. The problem we have is when we go from sort of 16, 17 into academies and then into the professional because there's just a serious problem that obviously uh, there's been a lot in the public domain. In terms of Yorkshire, I don't know what they're going to do, but um, I think it's going to get a lot messier for everyone involved. Um, and I think the final option, obviously, is going to be have to be me naming people, um, but whatever consequences that happens for me, I'm, I'm happy to take because I think the wider change is coming. I just need more people to join in with it. Right, guys, uh, I know there's one more question here from uh, our Leicestershire table. And uh, the rest of you Thank have you. been a bit slow at the back. This no is questions. for um, all the panel, actually. I feel a bit of fraud in cricket. I've been doing equality and fighting racism in football for decades now, and the issues are very, very similar. It was really good to see Tom's research, and I'd really be interested to see if you've shared that across other sporting bodies. Because as you said, data is everything. And what we struggle to do in a number of scenarios is have the factual information to be able to start the challenge. You produce some factual information that it will enable other people, especially in this room, to start the challenge. What I wanted to ask was, what was the ECB's response when they seen that data? And have they got a plan of how to deal with it going forward? Well, they, they can't argue with it because they provided me with it. So they'd be quite stupid. Well, stupid. They, they, they can't argue with it. Um, and, and that's the approach I've had to go along with this, is as soon as you bring anything that isn't objective and factual, it gets mixed up and people can put their own spin and do their own things in it. So their reaction was, um, this is shocking. We need to do something about it. That was a year ago. Uh, we proposed things to do about it. They've said they'll get back to us. That was a year ago. Um, and w ultimately, my PhD finishes in January, uh, and I'm again to present to them all my findings overall in a, in a big way. And it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. But if I'm, I'm honest, I don't have particularly high hopes for immediate action to be taken to, to justify it. So if you want to. Thank you. I think we've got to, that stuff up there is very important because that's not something, that, that's not my opinion, that's not your opinion, that's just clear facts. And to, I hope I'm not embarrassing, but Tom's a real asset for us moving forward because um, I've seen it close hand uh, where Tom can go into a role and earn a hell of a lot of money, but he's actually being. <laughs> He's been fighting a lot of battles uh, behind the scenes trying to move this space forward and to the detriment sometimes of himself. Um, and I think we've got to embrace the data and use that as our thing to put forward because it's all all right talking about things that have happened and sometimes, well, some t a lot of times at the minute, I can be guilty of that as well. But we've got to use what is reality, show it to the world. Because th there'll be a lot of people that would have been shocked in this room hearing some of them uh, percentages and drops, they will be shocked. It, there's a reason behind them big, 
the percentages and drops, but we've got to use an asset like Tom and really challenge the authorities. The ECB, I don't really have any hopes of the ECB, but then again, why are we going to the ECB? We're not on the table together ourselves. There's a lot of passion about the subject, and that's good, that's a start. There's a lot of people wanting to do, but we've got to formulate it in the manner that we can actually get the change that we all desire and want, and not 10 years time have another guy who's done a PhD, uh, another cricketer who's gone through stuff, and several, you've, I mean, you've got, in John Older and Chris Lewis, you've got uh, people who achieved a hell of a lot, and still, you hear things and you think, well, there's no reason for that. And it's time that we, as, as a whole, really started getting together. And that we're at one race, end of the day, we are a human race. <laughs> we've got, and we've got it, until we do that, we ain't gonna move forward, that's reality. Right, uh, one question here, from uh, which county are you? Derbyshire, okay, guys, Derbyshire. Manchester, right, let me tell you Manchester. something about Derbyshire. The chairman and the CEO of Derbyshire has today provided that bat you see there with the digital eye outside. When you came in today, you saw a bat there, a signed bat by all the Derbyshire county players. So that was a big shout out for them that they took their time to say, guys, we wish we could be there, but we have a similar event ourselves in Derby. So we'd like to donate this bat. And of course, we will then donate that bat again as a prize to who is gonna win the quiz tonight. We got a cricket quiz on straight after this. And uh, thank you, Derby. A big shout out for Derby. Thank you, Zed. Um, I'd just like to concur with both Azim and Tom. Uh, you know, the ECB, to get change out of them is so difficult. We tried, we approached Tom Harrison, we had discussions. The follow up from them is just so negative and they were pushing us back through the county scene, which is a failed system. You know, the whole county scene, uh, theme is so failed and so chaotic at times. And you know, it's time for disruption. This sort of gathering, we should have somebody from the ECB here to listen to what we have to say. We all need that. Everybody listens on social media. I'm getting so many messages coming here, right here on right. the phone, you know. So will this be passed on to the ECB? No need to pass it on to them. All of us, everyone, we want to go on the same track. We want the right thing for our children, for our grandchildren. There's no need to pass it on. People have got to come on board and get on that train. You know, a train of success is going to be when we all come together. But if we're all doing our own thing, you can't be here living in England and want to be a Bangladesh or Indian or a Pakistani. We all got to work together. It's all going to be a vote bank. All of you here, you're just going to be a vote bank. Your existence here in this city is which party are you going to vote for? We, we can't have it like that. We got to all do things together. Thank you for that. Any, John? I think this sort of event needs to be happening around the country. Um, there's, got to be this, there's got to be a start somewhere to getting people together. At present, we are, we are too, too many factions. We, I, I believe, quite honestly, in there's white people and there's non-white people. There's, we've got too many factions. Bangladeshis, um, whatever, whatever. We need as non-white people to get to mobilize around the country and that's the only way we are going to put pressure on the uh, organization like the ECB. Don't forget the ECB is responsible, professional, and amateur cricket in this country. And they've been doing a lot of nonsense. In 1998, the, the, the then chief executive, Tim Lamb, concerned at the level of racism within the ECB. He commissioned an inquiry and it was held and 15 recommendations were made. Now in our court case um, this year, Mohammed, heaven help us, um, the question was asked of the ECB, can you give us a list, tell us what's happened to these 50, 15 recommendations? 
and they point blank refuse because they've done nothing. The ECB is, is fond of making grand sounding statements, but they don't do anything. And they just want in their arrogant way to carry on as they have for X number of years. Again, I'll probably just um, reiterate something I said earlier. Um, I probably agree with, uh, as I'm on this, as the ECB, for me, is pretty much a hopeless case, um, to be perfectly honest. And I think, for me, that's why I'm here. Um, this is about self-empowerment um, amongst the group. Um, the people at the top, they have shown their colors over and over and over and over again in so many different ways. Um, I'm at a place where even asking that question of them doesn't appeal to me anymore. It's really about self-empowerment and doing what you can um, yourself. Um, we've had a lot of talking. We've had a lot of suffering. There's a lot that's gone on over many of our lifetimes, and yet not one thing has actually changed. Um, I think it's more time for the people that this is affecting to actually mobilize. And I think, as I made a very good point, in, in a case that was so important to all of us, um, in most cases, he was actually left high, uh, um, high and dry, to be perfectly honest. And if that's the situation amongst us, we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, we need, to, we need to step up as a community or as a collection of communities people who have a passion or even a bunch of immigrants who've come to this country and came here to, to do better for our families and future generations because I think we're all here because that's what's on the line. We've all experienced things and I think part of the drive is that we don't want that experience to carry on in the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. But the way we do that isn't by necessarily asking the ECB because they're shown over many generations that they are more than unwilling to do that. So it's really about mobilizing yourself. Can I just, like this is a little bit, um, just an idea to put out there is there's never been a better opportunity in regards to not, re not needing the permission of the governing body to do something. Um, you, there's money in most communities or a lot of communities there's money to do things but it's the opportunity the internet provides and you see the figures that live random games of cricket get streamed on it's ridiculous and you know if you really wanted to set something up you could set something up uh, where you have your own cricket league being streamed on YouTube or Facebook like we are now or something random that gets high viewing figures that brings in business brings in interest and ultimately from there if you, you talk about self-empowerment and doing it yourself what are we waiting for? There's no, you could do that tomorrow. If you look at the women, so my, my girlfriend's a, a professional player in the women's game, um, and they played at Edgebaston, um, and there were 250 people in the crowd, and it was you know, a nice-ish atmosphere, but there were 250 people in the crowd. The game got 275,000 views on YouTube. And you're like, that's, that's ridiculous. You've never had that kind of advertising opportunity before from a women's game, and you could easily do something similar. Um, within your own communities or, or, or strange way, and you, you don't need the governing body to do that. So that would be the idea. And just finishing off, and I, I promise you, if we were successful at whatever we do, um, everybody would come, no? Of course they would. Yeah. Azim, you, you want to say a word from there? Okay, guys, I think uh, we'll put a closure to this q and I, I see that um, a lot of messages are coming in here on, the, on our media. So here's a question here, one, it's an important one I'd like to touch upon. The, all the people on that table from Leeds, Leeds, put your hands up so everybody knows you from Leeds, right? That's uh, the Yorkshire table. Yorkshire, CCC. What is the BAME population in Leeds? What is it? Leeds and Bradford, BAME population. Whoa, <laughs> that is impressive, impressive, right? With 275,000, a, shame <laughs> a, a shameful uh, ratio, not down to talent. 
I hasten to add, what happens at Yorkshire Pathways where dozens of British, Asians, young cricketers are invited to display their talent every year, how many make it through? Not many, it seems. Is it just a tick box exercise? What about Yorkshire regional selection for young Asians? This pattern is across all counties in England. Change is required, change is imminent. I'm listening carefully to everybody here today and change has to come from within, like what the panel has said here today. We all have to change. Thank you very much. We're gonna move on to the quiz now. And Farak Rafiq will take care of the quiz because he's got more knowledge than I have. I don't think so, right. Okay, it's quiz time. Is everyone ready? Who wants to win this bat, the Abisha bat, desperately? Okay, you've all been handed this quiz. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you, Chris, Azim, Tom. Thank you. <coughs> Round of applause, please, for the panel. So can I have your attention, please, because I need silence, otherwise you will not hear the questions. Come in the prize if you don't hear the questions. So each captain. Okay. Sorry, sorry. I thought I was just. Each captain has been handed one of these quiz forms. Is everyone got this quiz form? Yeah, you all have it. Can we all sit down, please, and have a little bit of silence? Are we ready? Right, okay. So, first question. I'm gonna read out the question, and the, the, captain, the captain writes the answers, and he conferred with his team, right? So, the first question. Name the fielder who has taken the highest number of catches in one match. 20 seconds you've got to answer this question. Captain, get your thinking caps on. Confer with your teams and write the answers, please. Name the fielder who has taken the highest number of catches in one match. In one match. Question number two. Ready? Name the wicket keeper taking the highest stumping in his career. Name the wicket keeper who's taken the highest number of, who's done the highest number of stumping in one year. In his career, sorry, in his career. Question number three. How many ways, this is an interesting one, how many ways a batsman could be given out? How many ways are there that a bat batsman can be given out? Okay. Can we have silence, please? Question four. Question number four. Bowler, bowler who has the most hat tricks in international cricket. Which bowler has the most number of hat tricks in international cricket? Question number five. <clears throat> Name the wicket keeper holding a record for highest dismissals in Korea, in his career. Name the wicket keeper holding the record number of highest dismissals in his career. Question number six. Name the country that has bowled the most no balls in an innings. A country that's bowled the most no balls in an innings. Which country is it? Question number seven. 
Fritz Ficket Keeper holds a record for most dismissals in a, in a test match. Fritz, <clears throat> Fritz Ficket Keeper holds a record, record for most dismissals in one test match. Question number eight. What is common with these names? Anthony Robert Lewis, Michael Henry Dennis, Anthony William Gregg, Alan Joseph Lamb, Andrew John Strauss, Kevin Peters, Peter Peterson, Benjamin Andrew Stokes. What is the common theme in these names? Question number nine. How many players have scored triple centuries in test matches? Total number of players who have scored triple centuries in test matches. How many are there? Question number 10. Who scored most runs in a single test match? Who scored most runs in a single test match? Question number 11. Name the minister who devised loyalty test barometer based upon international cricket. This is a tricky one. Yeah. Name the minister who devised loyalty test barometer based upon international cricket. Who is he? Last, last question. Question number 12. Who is known as the Prince of Port of Spain? Actually, we're going to just finish at 12, okay? Who is known as the Prince of Port of Spain? Oh, you're going to have a 13. All right. Name the first black cricketer to play for England. Who was the first black cricketer to play for England? That's it. Leave it there. Right. What I want you to do now is take your captain, please, stand up. Can all the captains stand up? Captains, stand up on your tables. Captains on this table, please stand up. Right. Can you swap the answers with the table adjacent to you? So, Shokat, you swap an answer with the table next to you. So we don't cheat. Can you swap the answers with the table next to you? We're going to start marking now. So I think we're going to do some marking before dessert is served. It should be coming soon. Are we ready to mark your answers? Yeah? So remember, guys, remember, the winner of this quiz will get a coveted prize, which is a bat signed by Derbyshire Cricket Club. I suppose you've got to decide who takes it from your team. Somebody I'm asked reading the answers. No, no, you, you, somebody else, but I'm reading the answers. I don't have the answers, so I don't know. Yeah. Because the table in that. Okay. Right, question number one. So, Rhythm, can you put question number one up, the answers? 
the fielder who has taken the highest number of catches in one match. Well, there are a number of fielders, actually. Yeah, you, so your answer was anything like Vivian Richards, <clears throat> Judge Ruvinda Singh, Muhammad Azaruddin, Chris Serikan, Stephen Fleming, Graham Smith, or Darren Sammy. Any of those answers, you take the answer. I'm coming to the next one. Okay, the next question. Name the wicket keeper's highest thumping in Korea. It's actually, it's actually MS Dhoni. He had 123 stumpings in 315 matches, 350 matches. Okay, question number three. How many ways are there, they, they can be a batsman out? Well, there are actually 10 ways a batsman could be given out. I'll read them to you. Court, court, ball, leg before wicket, run out, stump, hit wicket, handle the ball, hit the ball twice, obstructing the field, and time out. Question number four. Baller who has the most hat tricks in international cricket. Who is he? Well, actually, the answer is that's it, Malinga. He, he's taken five hat tricks, yeah, in three ODIs and two T20s. So Malinga is the answer for that one. Malinga. Name the wicket keeper holding the record for highest number of dismissal in his career. The answer is M. V. Boucher from South Africa. Yeah, he had 998 dismissals, which is quite high. Question number six. Name the country that had bowled the most no balls in an inning. It's actually, it's England and Australia are tied. So if you said England, the answer is correct. Or Australia. Question number seven, which wicket keeper holds the record for most dismissals in a test match? The answer is, in fact, Jack Russell. Yeah. He did 11 dismissals in one test match. It looks like he dismissed the whole inning in a go. <laughs> question number, question number, Nine, eight, sorry, question number eight. What is common with these names? Yeah, I won't read them out again. The commonality is what? They were all England captains and they were all born outside England. Question number nine. How many players have scored triple centuries in test matches? In fact, it's higher than I thought. The triples, there have been 31 occasions when triple centuries have been scored by 27 batsmen in total. That's a lot of triple centuries, isn't it? Did you think it was, I didn't think it was 30. Question number 10. Who has scored the most runs in a single test match? No. Who has scored the test? This is a quite tricky. In a single test match, not in a single inning. The answer is, in fact, Graham Gooch, not Brian Lara. These are, some of, these are tough questions, I must say. And they've been set by our champion here, Mujibai. 
Number 11. Name the minister. This, this, is, this is a good one. Name the minister who devised loyalty test barometer based upon international cricket. Who remembers the, the Norman Tabit ball test? Absolutely. <laughs> How can you forget that? I thought that was before your time, Shokat. It's my time, eh? <laughs> question number 12. Last question. Oh, two questions, sorry. Question number 12. Who is known as the Prince of Port of Spain? Who said Brian Lara? Absolutely. Well done. And the last question, lucky for some, name the first black cricketer to play for England. Who? Yes. Who said Butcher? You did. Roland Orlando Butcher. He was born in, on 14th October 1953. Yes. So, so now, now guys, listen now. So you've got the score. Can you just tot up the, the, the tot up the answers, and just circle them around? Yeah, tot up the answers, circle around. So here, so here is who has scored, who has got all 13 correct answers? Anybody got all 13 correct? Anybody got 12? You got 12? You got 12 answers correct? Huh? No, you haven't. If you got 12 correct, right, I'll give you money for myself. Okay. Who's got 11? Anybody got 11? 10? 9? 8? 8? Anybody else got 8? You are the winner. Hands up. Applause, please, for the winners. Which team is this? Bangladesh team is tonight's winner of the quiz. That's it. I, I want to say something to the Bangladesh team. These were difficult questions. And to get eight out of 13 is a tremendous achievement. Well done, boys. Well done. I think we're waiting for dessert. You only got three. <laughs> so, the captain of Bangladesh team, please come on the table. Mujibai, Mujibai, can we get a bat? Can we get John? Captain of, in fact, the whole team, please come, come to the floor. Come on, boys. <laughs> Applause, please, for the Bangladesh team. Over here. Young men. Come on, don't be shy. Whole team is coming up, but oh. we're going to ask our young lady here to receive it. To receive it. Yes. Okay. Could I ask John? Can we can we have the bat here, please? Can we have the bat? Could I ask John to present the winner yes. the prize? Well done. John, well done. Hi. Well done. Very well well done. Nice to meet you. Kazibay, 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 kazibay
Hey, Guys, so, right. John, John is going to present the prize to the winner of the Bangladesh team. Who's going to take it home? <laughs> Who's going to take it home? <laughs> Right, everybody listening right now, Bangladesh, well done. Team Bangladesh has won the prize for the quiz tonight. So I got to thank you all for coming tonight. I hope you've had a wonderful night. Now I need to go take some pictures there with Chris Lewis. Chris, Chris, are you listening, Chris? Are you charging money for each photo because I've only got five pounds left? Yes, he's, he's given us a thumbs up there, right? Are we done? Thank you all.